Tonight, after the U.N. orders Muammar Gaddafi to stop attacking Libyan civilians, President Obama delivers the or else. And the resolution will be enforced through military action. I'm Harry Smith, also tonight, one week after Japan's earthquake and tsunami. A big break for the engineers trying to prevent a nuclear meltdown. And kids from around America, and Haiti too, do what they can to help the people of Japan. From CBS News World Headquarters in New York, this is the CBS Evening News with Katie Curry. Good evening, Katie is on assignment. President Obama delivered a warning today to Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi, stop slaughtering your people or face military action. The United States will help enforce a no-fly zone approved last night by the UN Security Council, but no American ground troops will be sent to Libya. French and British warplanes could be in the air over Libya by tomorrow. Hours after the UN resolution passed, the Gaddafi regime declared a ceasefire. But his forces reportedly kept shelling two cities, Misrata and Ajdabiya. And there are also reports that Gaddafi's forces are headed toward Benghazi, the rebels' capital. David Martin at the Pentagon begins our coverage. David, good evening. Good evening, Harry. Less than 24 hours after the U.N. Security Council passed that resolution authorizing airstrikes against Libya, President Obama delivered an ultimatum to Gaddafi. These terms are not subject to negotiation. If Gaddafi does not comply with the resolution, the international community will impose consequences, and the resolution will be enforced through military action. The terms of the ultimatum are stark. A ceasefire must be implemented immediately. That means all attacks against civilians must stop. Not only that, but Gaddafi must order his troops to retreat from cities they have either taken or threatened to take from the rebels. Gaddafi must stop his troops from advancing on Benghazi, pull them back from Ajubia, Misrata, and Zawiya, and establish water, electricity, and gas supplies to all areas. In other words, cede control of major cities and vital oil facilities to his enemies. And he doesn't have much time. U.S. and allied warships are stationed off the coast of Libya, ready to launch cruise missiles that would take out Gaddafi's command centers and air defense network. After that, aircraft, mostly British and French, operating from bases in the Mediterranean, would enforce a no-fly zone and threaten his ground forces with airstrikes if they attack the rebels. The president promised no American troops would go into Libya, but one way or another, said Secretary of State Clinton, Gaddafi has to go. We do believe that uh, uh, a final result of any negotiations would have to be uh, the decision by Colonel Gaddafi to uh, leave. Secretary Clinton will be in Paris tomorrow for one last round of talks with allies. But unless Gaddafi orders first a ceasefire and then a retreat, the time for talking seems to be up. Tonight, there is no sign Gaddafi's forces are observing a, a ceasefire much less pulling back. In fact, one U.S. official says they are still advancing on Benghazi. Harry? And David, what happens if these Gaddafi forces keep moving toward Benghazi? Benghazi is what one Pentagon official calls a red line. If Gaddafi attacks it, that would trigger military action. David Martin at the Pentagon, thanks. Gaddafi has ruled Libya since 1969, locking horns with eight U.S. presidents. One of his trademarks is to keep everyone guessing about his next move. And he seems to be sticking to that strategy. Mark Phillips is in Tripoli tonight. Mark, good evening. Harry, it's been vintage Gaddafi. It's been confounding, it's been confusing, and it's been confrontational. And for a while today, it seemed that Gaddafi was setting the agenda in this conflict again. His army was poised for a final, he said, conclusive assault against the rebels in Benghazi. He had gone on TV calling the UN action madness. If the world went crazy, he threatened, Libya would go crazy too. But then his foreign minister strode into a room to deliver a great diplomatic head fake. Libya too wanted to protect its citizens, he said, so its army would stop shooting them. Therefore, Libya has decided an immediate ceasefire and the stoppage of all uh, military operations. 
Having already celebrated victory at least three times in the past 10 days, the Gaddafi faithful were now cheering the declared end of hostilities. We are long our leader Gaddafi. They'll celebrate whatever they're told here, but what this is really about is Muammar Gaddafi's survival gamble. His army is now in the crosshairs of the UN resolutions and forces, but he has preserved it so far, and it is still the only serious fighting force in Libya. Rebels holding out in the town of Miserata say they were shelled even as the ceasefire was being announced. But what Muammar Gaddafi does with his army now will determine whether he gets to keep it and his job. And the Libyans have now invited international observers into the country, they say, to verify that they're holding to their ceasefire, and also, importantly, to help draw where that ceasefire line will be. Harry? Mark Phillips in Tripoli tonight, thanks. For weeks, Libyan rebels in Benghazi have been begging NATO, NATO for help. As Mandy Clark reports, they're grateful it may finally be coming. Demonstrating is now a family affair in Benghazi. Libya free, Libya free, this mother says. The Libyans are happy. We don't know what's, what will happen next, but at least somebody support us. But the fear here is the support will not come soon enough. This is a celebration of the no-fly zone rather than the Libyan government's announcement of a ceasefire. The protesters say they feel like the international community will finally protect them. And now they feel free to speak their minds and openly mock Muammar Gaddafi with puppets and chants. They also took time to remember those who died in the fighting, a heavy toll to get their voices heard. And they know the battle is far from over. So you'll keep going till Tripoli? Yes, yes. We want to free Tripoli too. In the city's main square, at least, this was about celebrating what they have achieved so far. But elsewhere, preparations were underway for what might come. There are reports that rebel forces once again came under attack, this time just 20 miles outside of Benghazi. Harry? Mandy, uh, was that attack before or after the ceasefire was declared? Well, it's believed that attack happened after the ceasefire. Now, rebels say they didn't put much credence in the ceasefire because it came from the government that has put them under siege for weeks. Their hopes for protection really remain with the U.N. Mandy Clark in Benghazi. Thanks. Now, tonight's other top story, the disaster in Japan. Officials there admitted today, for the first time, they were not as prepared as they should have been. One week after the earthquake and tsunami damaged a number of nuclear reactors, workers are still struggling to get them under control and prevent a meltdown. But Bill Whitaker reports there is finally some good news. As millions of Japanese silently mark the first week of the nation's greatest crisis since World War II, a few dozen workers at the Fukushima nuclear plant finally were able to connect a power cable needed to restart the reactor's cooling systems. Nevertheless, Japan's prime minister was unusually blunt. We are still at a critical state with the situation at the nuclear plant. People at TEPCO, firemen, police and many others are currently making a desperate effort on all fronts. For a second day, fire trucks doused Fukushima's number three reactor with 12,000 gallons of water in a desperate effort to cool the overheating spent fuel rods sitting in storage pools. If left exposed, those fuel rods and others in reactor four could melt and spew deadly radiation into the atmosphere. As for reactor number four, the situation is not as serious as reactors number two and three but we need to keep adding water to cool them and be prepared. But there is growing evidence that Reactor 4 does pose a significant threat. Photos taken by U.S. drones indicate water levels in the Reactor 4 storage pool keep dropping, perhaps because of an unseen hole or crack suffered in last Friday's earthquake. This could release more radioactivity than at any point in the crisis. The mounting problems prompted Japan to raise the severity rating of the disaster from level 4 to level 5 on the seven-point international scale, putting it on par with the 1979 U.S. accident at Three Mile Island. 
It was terrifying news for this Russian attorney living in Japan, who remembers the Chernobyl disaster was a level seven. It seems to all us Russians that the accident at Fukushima is quite similar to what happened in Chernobyl. Therefore, we're afraid and we're all running home. Japanese who lived near the plant were moved to shelters outside the exclusion zone and scanned for radiation. Are you worried, this woman was asked? That's why I'm here. It is frightening. I look at my children and worry. What little good news there was came from the UN's International Atomic Energy Chief, who said radiation levels in Tokyo, 140 miles from the plant, are not considered dangerous, at least not now. At certain moment, at certain site, uh, the uh, nuclear uh, radioactivity was dangerous, harmful for human health. Uh, in uh, other cities, like in Tokyo, uh, it is not uh, the case. The threat level is low, but the anxiety level is here in Tokyo, is, is high here in Tokyo, especially since winds now blowing the low-level radiation out to sea are about to shift and start blowing south toward Tokyo tomorrow. Mm. Harry? Bill, what difference is it going to make uh, getting that power into that nuclear reactor site? Well, the hope is that if they can start the electricity, they can restart those cooling pumps. But they won't know until they flip the switch whether those pumps are still working or were put out of commission by the earthquake and tsunami. Right. Harry? Bill Whitaker in Tokyo tonight. Thanks. The death toll from the earthquake and tsunami continues to rise. The official count tonight is nearly 7,000. More than 2,600 others are injured and more than 10,000 are missing. Meanwhile, Britain's Guardian newspaper reports 128 elderly people were discovered abandoned in a hospital six miles from the crippled nuclear plant. Some were comatose and later 14 died. There are tens of thousands of Americans in Japan. Lucy Kraft reports the U.S. government is offering to evacuate any of them who want to leave. The first flight from Tokyo arrived in Taiwan with fewer than 100 Americans. Sean Caden left, not because of radiation fears, but because daily life has become too challenging. We had power outages for two days where I was. Trains weren't running for three days. We had cell phones that were down. Charter buses have also started picking up stranded Americans in the northern Japanese city of Sendai. The bus will stay outside of the U.S. required 80 kilometer radius of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Since U.S. law requires all voluntary evacuees pay their own way, passengers had to sign IOUs to the government before being allowed to board. My mother wants me to leave. Uh, and my girlfriend wants me to leave uh, because of Fukushima. While many Americans are starting to make their way out of Japan, there's growing concern about Americans still missing, leaving a lot of anxious families back in the States. It's been a rough week for the families of Jessica B. Secker and Edward Clemens, two of four teachers on a government-run exchange program in hard-hit northern Japan. They hadn't been heard from until today. My wife received a phone call this morning, and uh, it was him. So after she finished screaming and yelling and, and we finished praying and uh, she told me that it was him and he was okay. She was uh, so happy and ecstatic about it, you know, that's why I was But their two friends, including Taylor Anderson, are among the more than 10,000 people still unaccounted for. Lucy Kraft, CBS News, Tokyo. As the damaged nuclear reactors continue to leak radiation, the Associated Press reports, UN monitors have detected minuscule, that is minuscule, amounts of radioactive particles on America's west coast. The AP says the particles are believed to have come from Japan, but its source says the level of radiation is far too low to be a threat to health. Coming up next on the CBS Evening News, lessons for Japan and for the world from the radio radioactive ruins of Chernobyl. As Japan tries to avert a nuclear meltdown, the world is still dealing with a fallout from the worst nuclear accident ever at Chernobyl. Nearly 25 years after the accident in Ukraine, people are still barred from a 19-mile exclusion zone around the site. And incredibly, the cost of the cleanup are mounting 
as Bill Plant reports. From the initial panic at Chernobyl to the lack of a permanent solution 25 years later, a lesson in just how hard it is to put the nuclear genie back in the bottle. Today, radioactivity still leaks from the crumbling structure hastily put up to cover the damaged reactor, just as it did when we went there three years ago. Right now, the dose rate is something like 200 times over the background that you'd have in Washington, D.C. 200 times? Yes. yes. Experts say that's about the same as 16 chest X-rays in one day. And the effect is cumulative. A more permanent solution to entomb the Chernobyl reactor has been planned for years. A massive steel dome, taller than the Statue of Liberty and wider than the St. Louis Gateway Arch, to be built at a distance because of the radiation, will be rolled into place section by section over the still deadly reactor. But the dome hasn't yet begun to take shape. The U.S. and the European Union are still struggling to raise the $2 billion it will cost. In Japan, the Fukushima complex will also have to be entombed, and the radiation levels will make that very difficult. These reactors are never going to be used again. Um, they're going to have to be entombed uh, for a significant length of time before anything's able to be, be done about them. And in Japan, officials are dealing not with just one rogue reactor, but six of them. I would hope that we'd be able to clean those up with less difficulty than we faced with the one reactor at Chernobyl. But I don't know, with the twists and turns of this thing, I don't know that that's a guarantee. That still unfinished containment dome at Chernobyl is projected to last just 100 years. But Chernobyl, like the Japanese plant at Fukushima, will remain radioactive and deadly for thousands of years. Bill Plant, CBS News, Washington. The pro-democracy movement in the Middle East was dealt some stiff blows today in Yemen, a key U.S. ally in the war against al-Qaeda. Government supporters opened fire this afternoon from rooftops into crowds of demonstrators below who are demanding the president step down there. At least 40 people were killed. In Bahrain, the majority Shiites have been protesting against the Sunni monarchy. Those protests always take place in Pearl Square. Well, today, the 300-foot Pearl Monument in the middle of the square was torn down on orders from the government. In Libya today, the Gaddafi government said it will release four journalists from the New York Times captured during the fighting this week. They're reported to be unharmed and in good health. In Wisconsin, a judge today issued a temporary restraining order which, for the time being, blocks the new state law that strips most public employees of the right to collectively bargain for pensions and health care benefits. Opponents are challenging a procedural move the Republican-controlled state Senate used to pass the law while Democrats were boycotting the session. And remember the old song, when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore? Well, tomorrow night, look up. Not only will the moon be full, it will be as close as it's come to the Earth in nearly 20 years, making it look 14% bigger than usual and 30% brighter. That's Samori. Coming up next, kids helping people in need. Finally tonight, when you see how the Japanese people are suffering in the wake of a natural disaster, uh, the reaction is to want to help. And that's exactly what some kids are doing, as Mark Strassman reports. Thank you. Thank you so much. With tsunami relief on their minds, kids in Dallas squeeze the aid from lemons, a lemonade fundraiser for Japan. In an hour, they raise more than $1,000. People all around the world are doing this right now. In Atlanta, it really makes me want to help those people. Kindergartner Tuesday Muse saw the destruction on television. Like kids all over, she's trying to make sense of the unthinkable. I was like, how can I help? Could I do a sale or something like that? And I was like, I'm a good artist. First, her mom helped Tuesday sell all her old artwork. Some to neighbors, the rest on eBay. So far, she's raised more than $2,500. Then she helped recruit 40 of her friends to paint. This dude somewhere in New York City, she's, he said if somebody would paint him a picture, he would give one 
$1,000 for the tsunami relief. Hi, Sophia. So they all got to work. For kids everywhere, Tuesday's mother says Japan's calamity hits home. They're better able to put themselves in other people's shoes than adults are. But they see um, another kid's house be destroyed, and that's their little castle, and they do think about that, and they can empathize. Some of them with wounds still healing. From Haiti, Joseph and Jeffrey look at Japan and see themselves. They're 14-year-olds still living in tents after last year's earthquake here. For me, it's not, it's not easy. It's in their despair, they link to Japan with plastic scraps made into bracelets. $10 a piece, $200 so far. Moved, like all these kids, to send hope in whatever way they can. Mark Strassman, CBS News, Atlanta. And if you would like to help the people of Japan, go to cbsnews.com and we will link you up to relief agencies. That's the CBS Evening News for tonight. Katie will be back on Monday. I'm Harry Smith in New York. Thank you for joining us. Good night.